Today on Ultra Simple Golf, we're back out at the beautiful Durban Country Club and we're joined by two Springbok and Sharks legend, Shaul McLeod and AJ Fenter. Shaul, great to see you. Thanks very much, AJ. Thanks. Thanks, and really appreciate you guys making time to join us out here. And, you know, any time we're at Durban Country Club, it's a, it's a great pleasure. And we're out here on the 18th hole today and we thought we'd have a bit of a challenge. You know, the old story backs against the forwards and uh, there's always a challenge there to establish who's got the most skill and who does the most work and all that sort of thing. And I'd love to try and create a situation today where we, we look at some different facets of the game. So, you know, the 18th hole has been the site of so many great finishes over the years in all these major tournaments that have been held here and obviously hosted the, the Volvo Tournament of Champions over the last two years. So it's a great site to have this, this little challenge. We almost reachable here today, quite a cold wintry afternoon if you do get such a thing in Durban. But um, the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to play the hole out. So it'll be interesting to see what your strategy is um, off the tee. And my dad's going to have a look at a couple of aspects of your game and maybe offer some, some advice, hopefully for the benefit of the viewers as well. And then, you know, we're going to put you to the test. There's a, a great bunker 30 or 40 meters short of the green, which is a real test for everybody. So I think we'll have a look at the power and the finesse side of the game. But um, really good to see you. And then, Charles, how's your game going now? What, what are you playing off? I'm over 13, yes, okay. bit of a shaky 13. Okay. It can go yeah. either way. Um, but yeah, I've, inconsistency I think is the, the biggest okay. thing in my game. Yeah. Um, but yeah, hopefully today it'll be the, the better side of it. Yeah, fantastic. And how long have you been playing? Yeah, I've been playing since 93. Okay. I think so I was really? eight, eight, nine that's years fantastic. old. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, that's, it's always good to know that the, the different sportsmen, the rugby players and the cricketers get a lot of enjoyment out of the game. And AJ, I know you've been around the up senior at the Else Invitational over the years. You, you do get a bit of enjoyment out of the game, don't you? Yeah, I think first thing, first important thing to, to clear out is that forwards work much harder than the backs. That's <laughs> yeah. the first thing. Right. So we settled that, it. it's gone. I always have to say it. I have to say it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I love golf. It's, it's one of those um, pastime things that really, you know, I can relax on the golf course with my mates. Um, yeah. It's challenging though, that's the thing that sure. keeps on bringing me back, you know, you, you can play one day amazingly and the next day you're just useless and, and that's what brings you back. So I'm quite excited to see um, what you guys can tell me today. Well, it'll be, we'll keep it nice and simple and hopefully you'll take something away that'll make a difference going forward. So I think first up we're going to, as I say, we'll play out the hole and uh, real birdie opportunity. So let's, let's see who's got it. <laughs> All right, guys, okay. we get on with it. Thanks. Excellent, well done. <laughs> we have to redo that. <laughs> I'll say no. Oof. Now there was no shape. Well guys, some impressive hitting there. I mean, you go with the left to right shape, you've got it down the right hand side then. There's a fundamental thing that my dad wants to address with you, but you know, you did catch it nice and square, so very interesting. AJ, terrific hit. I mean, really strong down the left hand side. Terrific or terrific? Terrific. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> and still very much in play. But when I look at your equipment, it's very interesting to see what you guys are using. You know, there's just been so many advances in technology over the last couple of years. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to call in our resident US USG uh, technical expert from the Golfers Club, Jason Rowe, and, and talk a little bit about what's on the market at the moment. All right, Jay, come and join us. Good to how's see the you boys? Here. How you doing? Jason. Shaul, how's it? Hey, Jay. Guys, um, I just watched your tee shots there, and uh, you know, you got, I mean, AJ had an unbelievable tee shot, right? You know, nearly past the green on the left hand side, and I saw Shaul a bit of a cut. Um, Stand up. Yeah, well, don't worry about that, we'll sort it out. But uh, bottom line is, I've just bought the new SLDR range, the, the silver range. SLDR was one of the few drivers that got a five-star rating on the Golf Digest hot list. So it really is a good driver, and born out of that, they've now covered the SLDR S range. The big difference that the S range has over the original one is that they've made it in four different lofts in the driver. They found the secret, you see, with driving is to put as little spin on the ball as possible. They have the optimum amount of spin. Too much spin, like you saw there, too much slice. With you, if you give you a driver that spins the ball too much, you'll actually lose distance. So we need something that's going to launch it high and give you a rainbow type flight. Okay. Right. So the SLDR S range allows you, because they've managed to move the center of gravity, which is in the face over here, 
the higher you move the center of gravity, the less spin you're going to get, but you still need to launch it up. So they move this weight down below, and you're also able to change the flight of the shot. So for Shaw, we had a big slice over there. I've set it on a slight draw, and it's got a stiff shaft, which will be perfect for Shaw. Okay. This hole, you know, such an exciting hole here at Durban Country Club. I mean, you know, if you're one shot out of the lead or whatever the case is, every time we watch the Volvo, the guys can birdie or even eagle the last hole because yeah. it's drivable. Going on your last shot, uh, uh, AJ, <laughs> I'm going to give you the three word to use. Okay. Because hey, the dri driver, driver is too much club, and I think I think Harvard would be too little. But just before we start, I just want to have a look at, at this driver here. It's one of an interesting stat. I was looking at this driver of yours earlier, and this is the TaylorMade Burner range, which was the most popular range that TaylorMade ever brought out. And I see you've hung on to it, and as you said, you're never going to get rid of it. But I mean, you know, something like this, once in a while, TaylorMade make a really good driver. I think 2007, when they brought out the Burner, everybody had one. And I, and I can tell you, it really is a good club, and I think they've got it right now with the new SLDR range. So, I mean, very interested to see how you boys hit this. I've said that on draw for you, Charles, so hopefully that'll help your slice a little bit. And AJ, you got the right to run a club there. Go with the three wood. Well, maybe we, may we do a deal today. No doubt, we'll do it. <laughs> okay. Charlie. That's better. That's, better. That's a lot better. Still a bit of a shape. Hey Jay, absolute privilege meeting you and having you on the show. I'm not blowing smoke now, but believe me, you are a very, very natural golfer. There are three tips that are glaring. One, you're aiming way right of target. Okay. You're aiming your feet at target, which I'll explain later, but your club head was aiming at the squash course down 18. Okay. Now by aiming that far right, you have to make a compensating error by coming over the top. That's why you don't hook it, you pull it. Right. Are you with me? I'm with you. That's number one. Number two, and they're all mini, but they're all critical. When you grip the club, your right forefinger is down the shaft. Yep not a good thing to happen because that I did it as a kid I thought that by throwing the club with my finger I'm going to get extra club head speed yeah. you're defeating the whole object of a late hit when you look at all the top players just before impact they're in this position here right you are in this position here that which leads me to the final point your practice swing at the top of your backswing, your hands are perfectly on plane with the club. Okay. When you hit the ball, you lay the club off here. Yeah. Old, old mistake. Old mistake. Yes. Again, your wrists are coming into the swing, and all I'm trying to convince both you and Charles, the game is about connection. Connection comes from your shoulders. Right. Your hands virtually play no part in the game of golf at all. So I'm going to sort your alignment out. Right forefinger on the club, not okay. down the shaft. Okay. And finally, try and cut the wrist cock out and try and get your club shaft parallel to where you're going, not laid off here. Well, that makes sense. Absolutely. Does that make yeah. sense? Absolutely. Those three things, you won't believe it. Makes Thank sense. You Thank you very much. I appreciate pleasure. it. Pleasure. Thanks for the day. Pleasure. Charles, thanks for coming on the show. You and AJ have made my day. I'm one of your biggest fans, believe me. Thanks. Now, basically there are two things. And again, I argue to my dying day, this is the only cause of a slice. One of the two. You've combined both of them. So <laughs> you've got it's a so problem. Big. <laughs> exactly. That's why your slice is massive. The first is your shoulder turn. You turn to here and stop. Now your brain is telling you you're not wound up. Again, I drew the analogy off camera. I can't knock you out from here. All I can do to hurt you is hit harder and harder with my hand. If I now suddenly turn to here, you've got a problem. That is exactly what happens in a golf swing. So I want you to turn, not your left shoulder under your chin, because you can get into that position here. This hasn't moved. I want your right, that's it. I want your right shoulder behind your neck. Now look, I'm wound up. Now, from there, once you've got to the top of the swing, your first move, instead of moving left, now what is being taught worldwide, 
which is totally incorrect, you swing in a barrel. That is not what happens. If I swing in a barrel, I am not transferring weight. I've got a turn. You said to me you saw that show with the balls. It's infallible. It works. You turn inside your right leg and then hit the wall, which is there. You see that lateral move? Now just put your right hand on your right hip and just push your hip to the left. Look where your shoulder is. You're Drops. inside out. It's dropped. Now what you're doing, you're not turning and then you're making it worse by what we call spinning. Now again, once you turn your shoulder big time, which you do beautifully in a practice swing, you turn forever, it now gives you enough time to move left. The minute you, but it's not left and stop, yeah. it's left and clear, both at once. Does that make sense? Yeah. You will not believe the difference. Again, Charles, an absolute pleasure having you. Thanks, Thanks my friend. On this week's Echelon, Did You See That Moment, we take a look at Steve Stricker at the 2011 John Deere Classic. He'd driven the ball in the left-hand fairway bunker, needing to get the ball onto the green and two-putt for a par to progress to the playoff. He hit an amazing golf shot to the back of the green and known for being one of the all-time great putters, he duly stood up over the 25-footer downhill left to right and made the perfect stroke to go on to be with the first time ever three-time champion one of the great finishers in PGA Tour history. Right guys, two great pars, sudden death playoff, now the tension's on. Now we've picked this shot here because it's tough, but again I'm going to try and make it a bit easier for you. Now the first thing, we've got a down slope here. So this sitting here with your shoulder low is taboo. You've got to try, we'll use your imagination, we're back to physics again. I want your shoulders to be parallel to the lie of the land. If you're going uphill, obviously you're this way. Downhill, you get this way. Now, also, I've done my homework. Walking onto the green, I saw it was looking very dark. Now, when you look down here, we're now down grain. So I know the ball is not going to check, and it's going to be quick. So it actually makes the bunker shot easier. Right. So all I'm going to do now, I'm not taking a lob wedge, I'm taking my 56. I'm going to play an ordinary bunker shot, club face not wide, wide open, but relatively wide open. My shoulders are now square with the lie of the land. Outside the line, release my right hand because I want to hit what I don't want you to do with your chipping, I want you to do here because I want you to hit the ball fat. Right. Now the final thing, is don't quit. Don't get here and just quit. Cock the wrists and allow the club to slide. You can see after impact my club face is still open. So I'm releasing the club fat but continuing through and the final thing I'm working about 10 meters from here. Now you'll see that the ball will run out the whole length of the way. Here I go. Here's my setup. Cock my wrist now release my right hand. Nice. Shot. Now again, it was a little bit too hard, but you could see that it wanted to yeah. check up. Let's have a look. Does now it? don't be afraid to release your right hand. Oh. 
Ja. Uff. Nice. Good luck. Danke. Well, guys, there was a, an interesting shoot out there. You know, pretty tough tee shot up up 18 there, and as, as short as the hole is, and it, it, a realistic a birdie chance as it is, it, it's a real challenging test. And I think you guys did pretty well. No birdies, but but solid holes. I mean, and from there, the tips that you got from my dad, did, did they make sense for you? Do, do you think you can take them from here and, and apply them and hopefully improve in the game? Yeah, for me, absolutely. And everything that he said about my, my swing being flat, something that I've kind of done before, I know about it. And my finger, it makes absolute sense. My alignment, I, like I, I was never, I knew I was kind of going skew, but not like that. That was an absolute eye opener for me. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely good tips for me. No, definitely. And yeah, you, Sean? for me as well. I've, I've hit a cut my whole life, and I lose about 15 sure. to 20 meters on that. So for me, just to go and practice that and have the confidence to aim actually a bit straighter, not that far left, and trust that the the club will do the work once I do the the basics right with my shoulder turn and my hip. What I enjoyed, you know, with watching both of you today is that, you know, you can see that you've been playing the game a long time, that there's this element of finesse. Obviously, you know, we, we see with a lot of rugby players, these guys are strong and it's brute force and you swing off your, yourself off your feet and, you know, most of the game is about balance and rhythm. Um, so it's, it's good to see that side of it. But still, you know, when you're as muscle bound as you guys are, the, these swing faults creep into the game. So you become limited in your ability to turn, you use the wrong muscles to generate power. And that's, you know, to get to the level of golfer that you might be wanting to get that's where there's a little bit of a change in mindset but like we keep reiterating that to make those changes it takes time it takes application on the range and it's hard otherwise yeah, you know yeah. but you if you've got expectations to be you know low single figure handicaps there's just no shortcut is there and, yeah. and it's Definitely. the same in, in the game that you play I mean the, the amount of dedication to to getting to where you guys are and have been in the game there's just no shortcuts are there well you know it's, what you were saying now is very interesting because for me uh, I'm a tall guy I'm uh, way out on 10 kg, yeah. so when I get on a, a par 4 where I don't really have to hit my driver that far, I don't have to, I, have, no. I basically take a 3 wood, but no, the instinct for me is yeah. to try and hit that thing as far as sure. I can, and the moment I do that, I go either left or right, so, um, you know, I'm playing against some of the older guys that definitely is not as, they're not as strong as me, and sure. all they do is just take a 3 wood, calm down in the middle of the fairway, so it's 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 the thing with rugby players I think where we want to kill that thing as, as hard as we can. Well, I think it's, it, it's so much of the game to be successful is you've got to take your personality and your instinct onto the golf course. If you're a, an aggressive, sort of almost like a flamboyant type of personality, adventurous, you've got to play that type of golf. You can't yeah. you can't have a Seve Ballesteros or Greg Norman mentality and play like a Nick Felder, Felder yeah. kind of thing, you know. And I think it, the nature of what you guys do, it's just flat out 100% of the time and, and then add it up. But the more you play this game, the more you start to learn it's almost like a game of chess getting to the yeah. ultimate goal sure. and you you know you look at Tiger Woods who Jack Nicklaus the two greats of all greatest of all time they they were plodders they had the power to overpower golf courses but it was they they, they managed their game better than anybody else and and that's really what it comes yeah. down to but you know when we look at the world of golf right now it's it's so wide open you know you know there's no Tiger Woods that's head and shoulders over everybody else and the game you know, need somebody to put their hand up right now to make it kind of, in my opinion, a little bit more interesting again. But there's a lot of talent out there that needs to break through. But I bring that back to rugby, and I want to start with you, AJ. I mean, in your prime, you had great teams in the Super 12, Super 14, even in the international scene that could dominate for a long period of time. It seems to be wide open again now, and there's a, almost an inconsistency in the results that the guys produce. What, what do you put that down to? Yeah, and, and, and first, your first point was when I, when I played, when I started playing, the New Zealanders were dominating sure. Super 12 at the time, Super oh. 11. And we, had, we just started touring then, so it was a little bit different. We were struggling with, uh, you know, these long trips overseas. Anyway, that's excuses with what we, <laughs> us old, older guys use. But um, when, I mean, for them now, uh, the competition is absolutely phenomenal. Um, for me, there's a few things. One, you, you, uh, the Sharks, for example, might have a Bismarck or a Beast out on a, on a day. And certain players that are not, not involved in the team, 
does make a change in, in the team and in the morale. So that might be things that, that uh, a team might be playing properly to, to today and, and next week not. Um, it could be because of touring, it could be because of um, they might have trained wrong in the week. There's so many different things that, 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 that must come together for a team to play well on Saturday. I understand. And, well, Charles, you're in the middle of a, an amazing campaign for the Sharks right now, but a, you know, a great start, but a couple of disappointing results. And you know, what is the feel in the camp right now? I mean, you, it's almost job done. You're on the right track. Yeah, it's, it's been positive all the way. We've been leading the competition for the whole way. It's just the, comp the competition, the way it's structured, you have to peak at the right time. You have to find the right way you want to play and stick with that and keep on building every week, every week, every week and then you are going to peak towards the end of the competition. I think that's the most important thing. There's no use winning your first six games. Everybody says you're the hot team of the competition and then you start losing and you fall off the pace. So I think it's a building process of finding that balance, how you want to play and how you want to win the comp and each week just taking a step towards that by tweaking your game to the way you think you will win this competition. So I think it's a lot to do with timing. So if you manage to pick the last six weeks of the competition, you're going to win. If you sure. pick the first six weeks, you're not going to win. I think also an important thing, with the competition being so long now, the teams that have got proper reserve yeah. uh, groups in place are the teams, because you're not going to go through a competition without getting injuries. So uh, I think often the guys with the, with the best benches and, 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 and reserve uh, groups are the guys that'll do well there. Definitely. And, you know, you obviously been around the Sharks for so long now. How would you guys rate this current shark squad? I mean, obviously you're currently involved in it, but I know you're moving on to, you know, the overseas side of things now pretty soon. But where, where would, first to you, AJ, you know, this Sharks team now in comparison to, your, in, you know, to years gone by? Phenomenal. I mean, uh, this, this group of boys that are together now, I mean, you can just go through the team and you can go into the reserve uh, uh, squads and these guys are phenomenal. Um, but what's more important for me, the Sharks, is what they've done with the business and, and, and what, uh, what they've brought in. Um, I, I think uh, there was maybe a time in the Sharks where things kind of staled a bit and with, with all the new boys coming in, John and, 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 and all the guys on the board, They've kind of, you know, cleaned up a little bit, and okay. for me, at the end of the, of the day, this is a business, sure. and and uh, and what they've done is really a, a, a strategic business move, and, and it's working. Sure. Um, and obviously with Jake White, Jake, we all know Jake's uh, a very talented coach. So, of course. yeah, I, I'm very excited. I don't know how much that he can say because he's still playing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you coming to the end of a, a wonderful era in Sharks rugby. You you going to be going overseas to Grenoble in in August, but you know. Obviously, winning this, the Super 15 will, will tick a box for you, and it, it's obviously hugely important in your career. You know, what would that mean to you? Yeah, it'll be lovely. It's, it'll be the first time that the Sharks do it. Sure. Um, but yeah, just more importantly for me is the the way we've, the way the team has played together, and the memories you make with your teammates on and off the field, and those are the things that that you actually take away with you. you don't take away the trophy that you won. Or stuff like that. I think it's more, and AJ will know he's finished now. It's more the the friendships you actually create during the campaigns and the memories you make in those campaigns that will yeah. last you much longer than the trophies that you actually win. But a, an exciting time ahead for you now, heading over over to seas to France, and you know it, it's got to be a great opportunity for you and a wonderful way to maybe bring your career to a, to a close. No, definitely, it's a it's a new a new challenge, and as I said earlier, it's a. It's exciting for me to see how different cultures and team, rugby team setups operate. Sure. So I've been at the Sharks for seven years, so I'm used to what we do here. So it'll be interesting to see how other teams operate and how they approach games and their training weeks and all that. So I'm looking forward to that. Well, it's, you've, you've been through all of this and you played rugby all over the world and, and you know, you've now been out of the game for four years. What are you busy with most of all at the, at the moment? Of the uh, beginning of this year, got involved with Supersport um, on the commentary side. So, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting to, to see the rugby field from that side, from that yes. angle. Um, challenging, as you would know, being a presenter. So, but, uh, yeah, I'm really enjoying it so far. Well, that's fantastic. And, Charles, when it's all said and done, what do you see yourself going into? <laughs> Too far still a, it's still a long way ahead. Um, hopefully, 10 years. hopefully my wife will work again after <laughs> a 
five years stint in France having a break and then that's I can look right. after the kids. Yeah, that's fantastic <laughs> and make sure that uh, you get some time on the golf course. It's, it's always great to see you know, South Africa's top sportsmen enjoying the game of golf. I think that's what's so fantastic about this game. It's amazing how many of you guys that have you know, reached the absolute pinnacle of your particular sports that really do get some enjoyment out of the game of golf. Thank you very much. Hey guys, thanks for your time today. It was really good to see you and hopefully we'll, we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Donald. Thanks, thanks for having thanks, us. Hey. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks, Sean.